Uh, we're here with uh, Chris Gonzalez, Professor of Urology at Northwestern, who's also the Vice Chair of Health Policy at the AUA, and we're going to be talking about GME and the urology workforce. Uh, Chris, uh, can you please uh, define the problem as you see it? So in the workforce of urology in the United States, we, we do have a significant problem that we're finding with the more information uh, that, that's coming to us. There's about a 10 percent shortage or decline over the past several years, and as of 2009, we're down to a 30-year low of urologists. We have roughly just a little over three per 100,000 in the entire population. Um, we are also seeing that uh, more and more from the academic perspective, uh, GME spots are becoming harder and harder to fund these. I think, uh, as you know, in 1997, there was a freeze on graduate medical education, and that was right around 170 slots uh, for urology. Currently, we're training 278 slots per year. And that's having, those funds are having to come from a lot of different sources, including clinical revenue, hospital funds, which are no longer sustainable. What message should we be sending about the importance of GME? Well, the importance of GME is, is that we need more funding to, we basically need more funding to train more urologists. And we're seeing these problems both in the urban and rural areas. Um, Graduate medical, medical education was frozen in, in 1997, and we, we think that not only are we not training enough urologists now, we need to increase the number of urologists that we're training. We've really uh, sent this message to Capitol Hill uh, multiple times, and there are two bills that are out there right now that the goal is to increase the total number of uh, spots of all the physician uh, specialties and primary care by about 15,000 over the next five years. We think roughly there's going to be, if you look at the big picture, 130,000 physicians short, about half in specialty medicine and half in primary care. And urology is amongst uh, the worst as far as a critical workforce shortage amongst specialties. Okay, can you uh, define the current scope of recruitment trends for urology practice and how it differs in urban and rural environments? So if you look at the number of urologists in the United States, there's about a 7 to 1 ratio of urban to rural urologists. About 20% of the U.S. population, over 50 million people, live in rural areas. And we know currently right now that 58% or about 1,800 counties in the United States do not have the services of a urologist. They have zero urologists. We also know from some pretty good studies that the mortality from prostate, kidney, and bladder cancer is higher in those counties when they have zero urologists. So the government's looking at a lot of this from a primary care perspective. We're trying to get them to look at it from a specialty care perspective. Uh, there's going to be some loan forgiveness. There may be some incentives for payment uh, in the rural areas to get people to go there. But we clearly have a problem, and it's a, a very large segment of the U.S. population that we're not serving uh, from a urology perspective. Great. Uh, how do practicing urologists cope with this problem of a workforce shortage? You know, what are the strategies, coping strategies that are available? So some of the things that people have talked about are what is the use of physician extenders and to help out. And we know that at least in some uh, primary care, especially in primary care, maybe some specialties, that physician extenders can do a fairly large percentage of what those particular physicians or doctors are doing. In urology, we know that maybe physician extenders can do a third of what urologists can do. And people would argue that if you bring more physician extenders in, you're going to solve your problem. But we don't, think, we don't really see it that way. We, we still are doing, need to do 65% of what needs to be done. We feel that physician extenders may help with access issues, but it's probably just going to create more work for us. And um, we're, we're totally in agreement with the fact that with primary care, there is a physician shortage. But we also feel that since one out of five, every, since one out of five uh, physician visits are urology in nature, the more primary care doctors you're going to bring in, the more work we're going to have to, be, have to do. And with bringing 30 million new people into the healthcare system with the Affordable Care Act, and the fact that by 2030, 20% of our population is going to be over the age of 65. And we know that people over the age of 65 require three times the amount of surgical services that people uh, under that age uh, require. Great. Do you see telemedicine playing a role in, in this problem? I think telemedicine uh, is, is a very interesting area. I think some of this other technology that's out there may help with the efficiency. It, it certainly is going to be better than not having that service there, but, but certainly, again, it may cover a certain percentage of what needs to be done, but the crucial aspects of having a urologist in an area with uh, no uh, uh, urologic uh, expertise, there's nothing that's going to supplant that, and that's what we really need to get out there. So I think there is some role for this to increase our efficiency, but I, I just I don't see this as being the, the complete answer. You know, there's other things that we also need to consider 
as far as our training for urologists. Just maybe we need to think about the time that we're training the urologists or how we train our, our, uh, our residents. Um, and the other issues are if we're getting more sophisticated. So when graduate medical education was, uh, funding was frozen in 1997, robotics wasn't around, a lot of the minimally invasive procedures we do were not involved. So to train our residents on surgical simulators and uh, robotics, it, it's going to take more money. And that money is not factored into what we get for graduate medical education right now. So no, that's a good point. Uh, you know, certainly urologists are unique in that they have uh, brisk practices both in the operating room and in the clinic. You know, can you comment on how that uh, may be shifting or that balance will be shifting with the, the new workforce shortage? Well, I mean, I think it's it's going to take its toll both in the in the clinic and in the uh, operating room, and certainly in the operating room. Um, I think that. Urologists, uh, the things that we do are becoming more and more sophisticated, and I, th I certainly think that's in both the office and the operating room. Certainly the operating room is not going to change very much for what we need to do. But in the office, I do think we, we do need to, to look at some other things, such as navigation systems to help us through uh, uh, some of the diagnoses and become more efficient in uh, getting more people in. The biggest thing is access, and that's what we keep hearing from Congress, and that's what our patients, U.S. citizens, complain the most about is access. They want to get in to see somebody right away, which is very reasonable. So I think if we can improve our efficiency on the front end, I think that that might be a solution to help with the access problem. But actually getting these cases done and doing the things that we need to do and, and the great care that we provide, um, we need more people. We need to train more urologists. Now, as you know, there are more and more women that are in the urology workforce. You know, how does that play a role in, in issues of uh, manpower? So we're, we're actually, Raj Pruthi is doing some really good work on that. And he's taking a look at, not just with women coming into the urology workforce, but of the new people coming in the workforce, what is going to be the head count? So is there going to be the, what's going to be the client head count or what's going to be the client FTE? Some of his preliminary work seems to indicate that there may be more of a hit in FTE, meaning that there's a certain head count there, but maybe they're only going to work 0.8 FTEs or not a full FTE. So those are the things that we're looking at as far as the new folks that are coming into urology is, are they going to be, or we, we assume they're going to be a full FTE, but we really don't know that. So we're going to take a look at that. Well, what's your best guess right now on that? You know, I don't have enough information to answer that, um, but, I, but I certainly think that the head count and FTE issue are not going to be in parallel and that probably more people, at least what we think is going to be more, are going to come in as a partial FTE. Okay, very good. Now what about the specific medical aspects of, of urology? Could this eventually go to other providers? Well, that's something we certainly want to keep a very close eye on. Obviously, we think we provide the best care for anything in the genital urinary system, but um, I certainly think there are forces that will certainly try and, and, uh, and uh, bring other folks in to try and do some of the things that we do. But I think the things that we're doing are correct, creating our guidelines, uh, be, just providing the best quality care we can. We want to make sure that we keep control of these particular disease processes because we do them very well. So what do you think are, are the key metrics to follow in the future so that this problem can be resolved? So if you look at the Department of Health and Human Services thinks that we need about 14 to 16,000 urologists by 2030. And that accounts for the aging population and also accounts for just the number of people coming in because of the Affordable Care Act. We think that the legislation, even if we would increase the number of urology training spots by 5 or 10% with GME funding, we're still going to fall short by 2030. And we think that right now we have roughly 9,500 urologists in the United States. Even if we increase by 15% each of the next several years, we're probably only going to have about 7,500 urologists. And if you think about the number that may be needed, or at least the, the government thinks we need, by 2030, that's going to be a significant decline. Now, certainly some of the efficiencies we talked about with software, uh, those things will help. Physician extenders, those will help, but it will not solve the problem. You know, so in a broad sense, what do you think the solution is to this problem? I think it's going to be uh, multifactorial. I think we need to train more urologists. I, I think everybody pretty much agrees with that. The question is how many? And we, we saw this happen back in the 1980s where there was some uh, debate back and forth in the urology community about are we training too many or are we not training enough? And then we had the perfect storm in 1997 where we thought we were overtraining urologists, too many urologists, and we had 170 trainees in 1997. And of course, that's when graduate medical education freeze came on. Now we're training about 278 a year, so that's 108 spots that are not filled. People have done some cost estimates on this too, and they think that it might take as much as $3 billion to train the, uh, the necessary number of urologists by 2030. 
So I think that's one facet of it. The second facet, we just have to become more efficient. We have to become more efficient, and we have to be smarter and wiser with physician extenders. I think those are going to help us. And I think also from our training perspective, we need to take a really hard look at how we're training urologists. And are we training, is it the right time? Can we cut back on some of the years? And I think these are decisions that we're all going to have to make as a specialty. Great. Well, listen, this is very informative, and uh, thanks for taking the time out today. To Thank you very much. Thank you.